and welcome back. And today I'm wearing my VCF sweater. <laughs> I love this sweater because it has a pretty fun story attached to it. Uh, I was up earlier this year in New Jersey going to an event called VCF East. It was my very first VCF event ever and it was epic. Uh, but I hooked up with a good buddy of mine, Chris, and we went down to the boardwalk to go play some pinball at a place called Silver Balls. And uh, because I'm Texan, I was woefully underpacked and I was absolutely freezing. And because I have no shame, I was complaining about it an awful lot. So Chris dug through his car and came up with this sweater and absolutely rescued the night. I ended up having an absolute blast because this sweater kept me from freezing to death. Uh, so I managed to steal it at the end of the night, and now every time that I put it on, I am reminded of one of the most epic events I've ever been to. But it's no coincidence that today I'm wearing this VCF sweater, because what we're working on today is very intrinsically linked with VCF. VCF is the Vintage Computing Federation. Uh, they put on some pretty amazing events, VCF East, VCF West. They uh, actually worked very closely with the local group here to put on VCF Southwest, but they also do a lot of other stuff. They have a pretty awesome forum with that's fairly active, which is kind of rare for forums these days. And uh, they also have a lot of really cool equipment hiding out. When I was up in New Jersey, they took me through their museum up there, and that was actually the first place I ever saw a Bendix G15 in person. Uh, and that museum is actually being expanded out, which is quite exciting. And they have a warehouse of stuff that is hopefully going to make its way into the museum, maybe on a rotation or something like that. But they took me through the warehouse, and it was... Man, there was a ton of great stuff back there. Uh, but one of the things that I saw that really caught my eye actually felt a little Centurion linked. But when I was up there for that uh, event in New Jersey, I took this with me. This is the mini Centurion that we built specifically for going to events. Um, and there's actually a lot more coming on this machine in the future. It needs new side panels, needs new veneer for the top and uh, uh, trim panels over here. And uh, one more thing that I really wanted to address was the terminal. It had an ads Regent 40, which was a little not quite period correct for this style of Centurion cabinet, but also it just didn't look as good as the ads Regent 100. So when I was hanging out with the VCF guys and they were showing me through the warehouse, I absolutely lost my mind when I saw this ads Regent 200 terminal hiding out in there. This is the exact same case as this gorgeous Centurion terminal up here. The only difference between the two is that this one has a uh, expanded control buttons up here on the far right, along the top, and over here on the left. I had never seen one of these in person. I was absolutely going insane. And uh, we actually pulled it out, turned it on, and it worked. And it actually worked as a second terminal for the Centurion, because the Centurion has multi-user support. So we had people using it. It was just... It was really cool, but I had to give it back and I was quite sad about that until I maybe planted an idea that I would like to restore it someday. And so uh, a lot of the VCF guys got together, had a bit of a conversation and decided that, you know, maybe it wouldn't be so bad to let me get my dirty, greasy paws on this thing. And sure enough, here it is in the lab today for restoration. Uh, although restoration may not be the right term, more like a refresh, because it does fully work on the inside. So there won't need to be any uh, electronic diagnosing going on today. It works. The CRT is beautiful. It is filthy though, so we need to do a lot of cleaning. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take this thing completely apart, give it a massive deep clean, paint the brown part blue, so that way it is a proper looking Centurion terminal to go with a proper looking Centurion system. And then we'll give it a test, make sure it's working as, as excellently as it was the last time that we used it. So, oh man, I'm excited about this. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's get to work. Okay, first things first, let's give it a quick test to make sure it survived the trip from New Jersey down to Texas. So go ahead and uh, flip the switch here. Beep, that's good news. The CRT is warming up nice and quick. And yeah, <laughs> that is a vibrant, gorgeous looking CRT. Uh, if I hit control local, we should go into local mode. It says local here, and I should be able to type. So H-E-L-L-O, that seems to be working pretty good. R-L-D for a nice hello world. Do a little exc exclamation point on there. New line went back, line feed goes to the next line. And then uh, let's just test out all the keys. The quick 
brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And yeah, <laughs> that all seems to be working fine. Uh, that's not a surprise. This is a full cherry keyboard and uh, they're pretty, pretty solid. So it's working perfectly. It's just filthy. So let's take this thing completely apart, take a look at what the, what's going on on the inside, uh, and then clean everything up, paint this, and uh, give it another test. To get this thing apart, there are four screws holding the top half on. Two are up under the front corners, and then the other two are on the back underneath this little ledge. With all four screws removed, the terminal splits in half, and the top cover pulls away nice and easy. And looking inside, it's not too bad considering how filthy the outside is. Keep in mind there is a CRT in here with lots of high voltage, so don't do this unless you know what you're doing. All right, next, let's remove the power and data cables that go to the analog board. And then we'll remove the two grounding cables that go to the CRT cage. And that CRT cage is held in with four screws. Once all of those are removed, it lifts right off CRT and all. Next, let's get to work on removing the power supply. First, we'll disconnect the power cable that goes to the analog board and is that a paper clip in the middle of my power supply? That's not good. The power supply board doesn't have a solder mask. This could have caused all sorts of shorts. Uh, anyways, let's get the plugs for the AC and the power that goes to the logic board off. And in classic Molex style, these are stubborn, but if you work them back and forth, they eventually come out. The power supply itself sits on a little sled that's held in with four screws. And after removing all four of them, it lifts right out, giving access to the transformer that sits beneath it. Uh, before we remove that transformer though, let's clean up some of the wires around here, starting with the power wire that goes to the logic board. Then the data cable that goes from the logic board to the analog board. And finally, let's get the big ribbon cable that connects the keyboard uh, loose. To get the logic board itself out, there are three screws along the front end next to the keyboard. And then there are three more screws on the back that hold the aluminum bracket in. With all six removed, the logic board shifts back and then can be lifted out. Next, let's get that keyboard out of there. There are four screws holding it in place, two in those large recesses and two more on the front edge. Uh, then let's disconnect the power wires that go to the on off switch and finally lift the keyboard and trim panel up and out. Now that I'm done going on a massive tangent, let's get back to that transformer I mentioned earlier and get it out of there. There are four screws that go through the core at the corners, uh, and with those removed, it comes free, marking this as the last piece to remove from the bottom case. But we're not quite done yet. We still need to separate the keyboard from the trim piece. There are seven or eight, maybe, I don't remember, uh, screws that go through the keyboard holding it in. With all of those removed, the cherry keyboard pulls straight away from the trim piece. Finally, we need to remove the power button. I marked the orientation of the wire colors so I can get the button back in properly. Then it's just one big nut and it comes right out. Uh, finally, we need to get the front plate separated from the main upper case. Fortunately, it's held in with just three screws that are easily accessible. With all three removed, the front plate just slides straight up and out. To get the ADS Regent 200 nameplate off, I used an old hairdryer and razor blade to work through the glue. After a little bit, it peeled off without bending or kinking or anything, so we're going to be able to reuse this piece. Now that everything is apart, let's get to work cleaning things up, and I'll start with a good spray down. It seems like a crazy amount of work just to get down to these four pieces, but this is really all there is to clean. After they're nice and wet, I use a bucket of soapy water and a brush to scrub them down. Dish soap is really gentle on old plastics and paint like this, so this is a really safe way to clean old cosmetic components like cases. This brush is just a generic wash brush I found at the local hardware store, and it seems to work really well for getting off the majority of grime and grossness. The two front panels need a heavier clean though if we're going to repaint them. So they both got a heavy spray down with some simple green, which is still safe on paint, it's just a bit more aggressive than soapy water. After scrubbing them clean and then giving them one more wash down with water, I took them inside to dry them completely out with the hairdryer. 
I wanted to make sure that there isn't a single droplet of water on there or it'll really mess up the paint. And speaking of paint, the original brown paint is absolutely thrashed. It is beyond savable, meaning it needed a repaint no matter what. And since we're repainting it anyways, we might as well color match it to the machine it's going to be used with. Sure, it's not the original color, but by painting it blue, the terminal is going to get a second shot at life, and that's definitely worth something as reversible as a color change. And speaking of that color change, let's get started. The first step is to lay down a good, clean coat of primer. For this, I just used some generic gray primer I picked up at the hardware store in a spray can. It sprayed on really well and came out nice and clean, so the next step was to get the color matched blue paint down. I initially tried to paint it on with a paintbrush, but this was an unmitigated disaster. I tried two different types of paintbrushes, foam and bristles, and it just refused to lay down smooth. It looked really splotchy, it didn't level well, and overall it looked like absolute garbage. So frustrated, I turned the camera off, stripped the whole thing back down to the original brown, reapplied primer, and then went for option two. Years ago, I got this paint sprayer from my father-in-law. I actually use this exact sprayer to paint my Isuzu Bellet, so it's my go-to whenever I need to spray some paint. I thinned out the paint, dropped it in the sprayer, and laid it down on the pieces, and boy howdy, what a world of difference. The paint laid down beautifully well. Otou-san, このスプレーが本当にありがとうございます。ベレットにも、このプロジェクトにも、いろいろに使ってるから、すごい助かります。ありがとう。And while that dries, let's get the outer case clean. It was still pretty scuffed up, so I pulled out the orange pumice hand cleaner and that got the really stubborn stuff out. I followed that up with a wipe down with some glass cleaner and the outer casing came back looking near perfect. Uh, on the bottom, the two rubber feet in the back had been broken off after years of moving around. Fortunately, they used pretty generic rubber feet that are held on with a screw. Uh, I was able to find new replacements at the hardware store for just a few bucks. The last big cleaning job to tackle is the keyboard. This is crazy tedious, but I just popped on some Adrian's digital basement and got to work. I pull each key off, toss it into a bucket of soapy water to soak, then slowly clean and dry each key one by one until they're all looking brand new. Then I just uh, pop them back in place and we're good to go with a keyboard that looks amazing. And now that everything's all clean, let's put it all back together. Starting with the transformer, cinching it in place with the four screws. Then we'll get the logic board back into place, tightening it down with the six screws, and we'll follow that up with the power supply board, locking it down with the four screws. Then the big CRT and cage, which again is held in place with just four screws. We'll set the keyboard into place on the newly painted trim piece and lock it down, then get that new panel back into place on the uh, base of the terminal, and before we slip the new blue front panel back into place, let's get that ADS Regent 200 trim piece from earlier back on. I just used some double-sided carpet tape cut to the right shape to hold it in place. Then the front panel slides into the top cover, although it was quite finicky to get it all lined up correctly. But anyways, let's get that new fully assembled top piece back on. There we go, all back together and oh lord almighty. <laughs> That looks amazing. That turned out so much better than I was imagining. This thing cleaned up and looks brand spanking new. <laughs> but uh, it's pointless if it doesn't work. So let's see if I've broken something. Uh, let's go ahead and flip the power switch. Beeped once. Beeped twice. That's good news. We should see the uh, CRT starting to warm up here. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I was getting a little nervous there. Uh, we warmed up. Let's go control local and do uh, the... Ooh, my E key doesn't want to work. All right, well, apparently I am full of all sorts of typos, uh, but the... The E key, oh, the E key was just, maybe just a little dirty. It seems to be working now. Uh, let's try that again. The 
quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Uh, that E key is definitely still a little sticky, but I think the more we use it, the better it'll get. <laughs> that seems to be fully working, uh, except that right now it's just in local mode and a data terminal is meant to be hooked up to a computer. And the reason that we painted it blue was so that we could hook it up to a Centurion. So let's do that next. All right, I've set the terminal up here next to the primary terminal. You can see that we've got everything booted up and we're fully into the operating system. We've got the full status display going on here. Uh, let's see if we can get multi-terminal mode going on. All I got to do is hit control C, CRT1 ready. That's excellent news. Then we'll do a dot STA. Oh, that's interesting. The screen flashes while it's doing the STA. That's really strange. Uh, but we can see we're both... <laughs> Both terminals are fully into the operating system and working perfectly. And this uh, CRT actually looks quite a lot better than that CRT. Uh, let's do a directory listing. We'll do a directory listing of three. Uh, so it's currently reading that. You can see that whenever it scrolls, the screen flashes. But while it's doing that, we can do, say, something like a directory listing on one. Uh, <laughs> and simultaneous disk reads. Oh, that's awesome. The uh, multi-user functionality of the operating system is really shining through here. That is awesome. But uh, that flashing is really wild. All right, I've zoomed in a little closer on uh, the new CRT here. Um, this is probably gonna flash a little bit, so if you're sensitive to flashing patterns, maybe skip ahead a little bit. Uh, but we'll go ahead and do a status here. Oh, that flashing is rough, but check this out, okay? So we've got our four disks li listed over here. Data 6 and soft term are the two platters in the Hawk. Uh, uh, number two is the floppy drive, and number three is the Finch drive. We've got all that set up. We can see that we've got write protect on for uh, both Hawk platters. Here's where it gets interesting. We've got CRT0 and CRT1 set up. Those are the two different data terminals. So we can see all data terminals right along here. Right now, we only have one MUX card working in there. So we only have four possible data terminals to show. Uh, now, this is an interesting one right here. Size 2K, name, compose. I actually ran s.compose on the other terminal, CRT0. So we can see how much of memory that CRT is currently using and what job it is currently running. So on ours, we're showing that we have a base partition size of 6K, but that can change dynamically depending on what program we're running. So that's a little more info on the uh, status display screen here. The CRT itself, I believe, is working 100% perfectly. We may just have some strange uh, escape sequence or control code uh, problems that we got to figure out between the Centurion and the Regent 200. There we go, CRT0, CRT1, both up and working and demonstrating the multi-user capability of the Centurion. This one turned out gorgeous. It turned out so good. The uh, blue is properly color matched and it's sprayed on beautifully and it just looks absolutely amazing. The only thing that it's missing is a Centurion emblem right here in the center. And I'm not sure if I'm going to do that or if I'm not going to do that because the ads emblem on the bottom does add a little bit of flair over to that right side. But uh, maybe I'll print out some vinyls and hold them up there and see what I think. Uh, for now, though, this is fantastic. I absolutely love it. We do still need to figure out why it's blinking. It might be a uh, communication problem or it could be a setting issue. I don't know. There's a lot that we need to do. So we need to sit down and read the manual, which thankfully exists. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to leave it sitting up here, even though that's not where it's going to live permanently. It is going back over to the mini Centurion. But I'm going to leave it up here for a little bit to get some nice beauty shots of it because it looks really cool with both of those ads regions right there on top of the system. So I want to thank everybody at VCF that uh, helped get this terminal here. Uh, Jeff, Dave, Bob, Ian, Thomas, Doug, you're all absolute legends. Thank you all so much for trusting me with this terminal. It's gonna leave, live an amazing life with the Centurion. And on the Mini Centurion, it's gonna make its way to plenty of events. So if you wanna see this terminal and the Mini Centurion in person, come to an, a VCF event. 
Now, probably the next VCF event that the Minis and Trainer will make it to will be a VCF Southwest next year, but I am planning on going to VCF East this year if uh, I can get the schedules to line up. So if you're gonna be there, hopefully I'll see you at that one. I want everybody to check out VCF and just go give them a high five because they're excellent people. Uh, but I most importantly want to thank all of you for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.